Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, and their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions, for Moses said. Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother shall be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin, that is devoted to God. Thus. You nullify the word of God by your tradition handed down, and you do things like that. Are you so dull? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all food clean. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it comes from within, out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. You've probably heard the word holy before, or at least sang it in a church song once or twice. And for most people, this idea is really just connected to being a morally good person. So... God is holy because he's morally perfect. Yeah, that is part of it. But in the Bible, the idea of holiness is even bigger and more rich. What it's really describing is how God is the creative force behind the whole universe. He's the one and only being with the power to make a world full of such beauty and life. And so all these abilities, they make God utterly unique, which is the meaning of the word holy. So a helpful way to think about God's holiness is by using the sun as a metaphor. The sun is unique, at least within our solar system, and it's really powerful. It's the source of all this beautiful life on our planet. And so you could say that the sun is holy. And you can actually take this metaphor even further in that the whole area around the sun is also holy. Yeah, because the closer you get to the sun, the more intense it gets. Yeah, exactly. So that very power and goodness that generates all this life is also dangerous. I mean, the sun, if you get too close, will annihilate you. And in the same way, there's this paradox at the heart of God's own holiness, because if you're impure, his presence is dangerous to you. And not because it's bad, but because it's so good. And so the first time we see this paradox of God's holiness, it's in the story of Moses and the burning bush. So God tells Moses to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. And Moses covers his face in fear, and God says, hey, don't come any closer. It's intense. It's actually that intensity of God's holiness that's explored even more in the stories about Israel's temple, which was the main place where God's holy presence was located. And at the center of the temple was this room called the most holy place, this the hot spot of God's presence. And whether you're an Israelite living in the land around the temple or a priest working right in the temple, you're in proximity to God's holy presence, which is dangerous. Yeah, this is a problem. So how's it supposed to work? Well, in the Bible, the solution is that you need to become pure. So like being morally pure. Yeah, and that's easy enough to understand. But the Bible spends a lot of time talking about another kind of purity, being ritually pure, which is a state where you separate yourself from anything related to death like touching things like diseased skin or dead bodies or even certain bodily fluids. All these make you impure. And becoming ritually impure isn't necessarily sinful. What's wrong is waltzing into God's presence when you're in an impure state. 
And so that's why God gave the Israelites very clear instructions for knowing when they were impure, steps to become pure, so that they could go into the temple again. So that's what the book of Leviticus is about. Right. But it doesn't stop there. This idea keeps developing. So later in the scriptures, we find this really interesting story by a prophet named Isaiah. And he has this crazy vision where he's in the temple and he's right in God's presence. He's totally terrified. Yeah, he knows the rules. He shouldn't even be in there. And he's worried about being destroyed. And then this crazy creature called a seraphim. Yeah, that is a crazy creature. (laughs) Totally. So it flies over with a hot coal, and then it sears Isaiah's lips with the coal and says something really weird. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. So this burning coal somehow makes Isaiah pure. Yeah, it's remarkable because normally if you touch something impure, it transfers its impurity to you. But now here's this new idea where you have this coal, this very holy and pure object, and it touches Isaiah and it transfers its purity to him. Isaiah is not destroyed by God's holiness. He's transformed by it. I mean, the implications of this are just huge. But there's one more development this time from another prophet, Ezekiel. And he has this vision where he's standing at the temple and he sees water trickling out from it. And then that water turns into a stream and then it grows into a deep river that starts flowing through the desert, leaving this trail of green trees behind it. And then it flows into the Dead Sea, making everything fresh and alive. So instead of becoming pure first and then going into the temple, here God's holiness comes out from the temple, making things pure and bringing them to life. What does it all mean? So we don't know until we meet this man, Jesus. And he claims that he's fulfilling all of these ancient visions, but in surprising new ways. So Jesus, he went around touching people who are impure, people with skin diseases, a a woman with chronic bleeding or dead people. And when he touches them, their impurity should transfer over to Jesus. But instead, Jesus' purity transfers to them and actually heals their bodies. Jesus is like that holy coal in Isaiah's vision. Right. And Jesus claimed that he was the human embodiment of God's own holiness and that he and his followers were now God's temple so that through them, God's holy presence would go out into the world and bring life and healing and hope. And so this is why Jesus described his followers as having streams of living water flowing out of them. So this is our part of the story where we find ourselves now. But... Where's this all heading? So the last pages of the Bible end with a final vision about God's holiness. This time it's by a guy named John. And in his vision, we see the whole world made completely new. The entire earth has become God's temple. And Ezekiel's river is there, flowing out of God's presence, immersing all of creation, removing all impurity, and bringing everything back to life. We believe. So I don't know if you remember, but I've been talking about this Bible project series for a long time, and I've been I've been waiting to unleash one of these videos so that you could uh, just feast upon it. One of the things I love about the Bible project is it's got great theology, it's very artistic and creative, and they're short, so you really can use these as tools not only in your own lives but in the lives of your family as you're trying to describe things. There's one of those videos for every single book of the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Isn't technology amazing? I mean, talk about technology that's glorifying to God. Well, today we are talking about the issue really of holiness and what makes us pure, what allows us to come into relationship with a holy God, which in the video we discovered is dangerous for people who are impure. And just to make sure, I want everyone to raise your hands. Everyone raise your hands. Okay, you're raising your hands to the question, who all here is impure? Okay, just to make sure we're all, we're all on the same page, okay? We're all on equal footing, um, assuming Jesus isn't in the picture yet, okay? So just hang with me. Uh, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. We're, uh, we've already looked at those first 23 verses, and I want to reference those this morning as we ask the question to ourselves, what makes us impure? Pure. Purity is important, isn't it? It's not just important to God. It is important to us. I've never met someone who enjoyed drinking dirty, polluted water. Have you noticed that it's not something we 
enjoy it. When you drink dirty, polluted water, like, for example, if you go up to Mount Rainier and drink the water up there without filtering it, you get marmot's revenge. How many of you know about marmot's revenge? All right, well, I guess you have to be from Washington to know about that. But let's just say it's not a pleasant afternoon. And that's what happens when you drink polluted water. And purity is important for all of us. In fact, most of us appreciate not just uh, pure water. We appreciate pure air. We appreciate pure relationships. We appreciate purity. And this is Jesus' main issue with the Pharisees in the text that we've already looked at is the conflict of thinking that our human actions can make us pure before God. You see, Jesus is changing everything. He really is turning things upside down. And for so long, people have thought that the path to God was not just through the law, but through the additional commandments and traditions of the elders, right? That's why Jesus says, hey, that thing that you're talking about with washing your hands, it actually isn't in Scripture. It's a man-made tradition, a man-made rule, and I'm not buying it. And that's what Jesus says to them. He believes that actions are not, uh, are, are not something that bring us closer to God. So the question is, what is and what does make us closer to God? What brings us into the presence of a holy God? And he denies the oral tradition or the hand washing. And he actually, and this is sort of a, sort of a, 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 a very blunt passage in which Jesus comes head to head with the Pharisees, calls their way of practicing faith heartless religion. All talk, no action kind of faith. And he actually calls... The, the Pharisees, hypocrites. A hypocrite is someone who says one thing and does another. And then in verses 6 through 8, he brings up the example of honoring your parents. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked too much into this whole thing of honoring your parents, but honoring your parents isn't an added tradition. It's a part of God's heart, right? It's a part of God's heart from the very beginning because the homes and the households that we are raised in allow us to begin to understand how we are supposed to not just honor our parents, but to honor God. And he says the tradition that the elders have developed was really so that they could hide behind the religious baggage of the extracurricular uh, teachings and whatever they consecrated as unto God, they wouldn't have to use to support and honor their parents. Now the cultural part is honoring our parents looks different in different cultures, doesn't it? But the heart of God is honoring your parents. And Jesus says, this isn't the kind of faith that you have. This is impure. This makes you someone that needs help coming close to God because your teachings and your extra traditions aren't bringing you close to God. And it's really because you have disengaged your heart from the heart of God. And here's what makes all of us impure. is we start out life disengaged and disconnected from God. From the moment that we sin. Because sin disconnects us from the heart of God. And when our sin keeps us in a disconnected relationship, we begin to develop all sorts of rules for our life. All sorts of ways of thinking. And some people hide behind religion. Some people hide behind business. Some people hide behind, hey, they're just blunt with it. It's all about me. I'm a selfish person and my way is the highway and I'm ready to pursue this life for what I can gain out of it. And there's all sorts of different paths that people choose and it's all baggage that keeps us disconnected from God. And the key point in all of this that Jesus is bringing up with these Pharisees is where's your heart in this? This, this religion that you uh, are, 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 are uh, supposing to teach about is actually not only keeping you in bondage, but it's now saddling all sorts of religious baggage on other people who are trying to connect with God, and it's keeping you disconnected. And Jesus says, where's your heart in this? Religion becomes legalism when you disconnect yourself from the heart of God. It's like, like a professor used to say, a form without meaning is dead. 
How many of you have ever been a part of something that was, it looked good on the outside, it had good appearance, but it was rotten to the core on the inside? It's like biting into an apple and you discover that you just bit into a worm. Hey, that's a little extra protein, but it's sort of disgusting. (laughs) That's what Jesus is doing. He's biting into an apple that is rotten to the core. Not because traditions in and of themselves are bad, but because it's these traditions that are being taught that brings you closer to God. And that is not the way of God. Traditions that help you become aware of your need for God and connect your heart to God are good. But traditions that make us feel justified in our own human strength are, are absolutely the worst possible thing that you can believe. A Pharisee is someone who believes that a rule is enough. And actually, you end up hiding behind rules so you don't have to do the right thing. It's like you've got the rule without the relationship, and now all you're left with is legalism. And legalism is bondage and death, and that's all it brings to your life. In fact, anything in your life that you disconnect your heart from will die. Just think about it. Try to disconnect your heart from your wife or your husband. How long can that work out? Right? It just doesn't work for very long. You've, you've got to have an engaged heart. Disconnect your heart from your career. And what do you've got? You, you're, you're in bondage to a, a career that means nothing to you. You're waiting for the end of the day. You're waiting for, you've got to engage your heart. A career without your heart is painful. Even if it's not something you've chosen, at some point you've got to choose to engage your heart so that you can experience life in that setting. There are all sorts of things that, suck us dry when our heart is not engaged, but the thing that kills more than anything is when people hide behind religion without heart. Heartless religion is just a recipe for hypocrisy, and all I'm saying is I'm looking out at the world thinking that is not what this culture needs. They don't. They're running from it. And it's not because, it's not because uh, Christianity is difficult and forces us to examine uh, difficult questions because that's actually what Jesus is advocating for is that they have tried the church, they've come into fellowship with people, and they have found people who are unwilling to acknowledge the difficulty of Christianity. Now, I know last week I talked about the easy way, but that's the way with Christ. And when you get Jesus in your boat, he starts to poke the bear, doesn't he? He opens stuff up. And this is what the world is saying. Like, the pews are filled with people who are unwilling to ask difficult questions about their own faith. They say this, but they do this. It's like they're Christians, but they're looking for a loophole to not love you. They're looking for an excuse to judge you. They're trying to figure out a way to trap you. Once you get through the doors, what we really want to do is just put a kibosh on your life and make sure that you have a good burial. So they run. And if you've been in the church long enough, you felt the teeth of that trap, haven't you? Oh, I sure have. I grew up in the church. It's a miracle that I'm still a Christian. <laughs> Let's just poke at ourselves a little bit for just a moment, okay? It's good. Last night I was in the Comedy fighter show. I don't know how they dragged me into it, but it's good not to take ourselves so seriously. I remember when I was in high school... Uh, I was, you know, my dad had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. I was going through a hard time. My heart was not in a good place. I was trying to fit in. I was trying to be loved by people. And what I really needed was a mentor to come alongside of me and to walk with me through those difficult heart issues. And one day, my best friend convinced me to go get an earring. So I decided to get two. Scratch that. I got three. I'm just in confession mode because I want to lead with a little bit of vulnerability this morning. So if I need to check my man card at the door, I'll do it. It's all good. I got two earrings right here and and one right. Remember when that used to be popular? If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's all good. I got one right there. (laughs) And I thought it was so cool. And someone in the church who uh, I had a kind of a disconnected relationship with me freaked out. Now, the reality was I was in a bad place. I, I, I just, I was in a very, a very hard time. I was trying to figure out this thing with my dad. I was trying to find acceptance in my life. And this is how it felt to me. There was no relationship. There was this rule that was, that, that really had more to do with culture and tradition of, of this person. 
and they wanted me to, and I'm just, I'm not necessarily saying I would get another earring today. I'm just saying at that moment I had one and I could have really used someone who would have come alongside of me and walked with me through that to help me understand the heart of Christianity is here, not here. It's here, not here. It's here, not here here. I mean, what are we going to do if someone walks in with blue hair? Nothing. Because that's not what brings people to Jesus. Blue hair is the same as uh, uh, white hair. It's the same as brown hair. In fact, sometimes my mom, I have to give her a little hard time because she colors her hair. I should, probably shouldn't have said that out loud. But I have to ask her, what's the difference between blue and blonde? Like, it's a chemical all the same. Like, what is the difference? And Jesus is coming alongside these Pharisees because he's got to take a hijacked Christianity from a people who thinks it's all about outward appearance. He's connecting these extracurricular traditions back to the commandments of God. And it really comes back to where it all goes awry, here. And so this is how I know if a tradition is bad or not. Because I don't think traditions are necessarily bad. They can be great. But do they connect you to the heart of God? No, no, no. Listen, there is no salvation outside of Jesus, period. doesn't matter how long you've been in church or what you've been taught. That's what Jesus is saying here. In this moment, he's saying Jesus first, Jesus only. And then all sorts of other things begin to align with that. But until you have Jesus, don't try, to, don't try to reform your life. What are you reforming it to? What kind of standards are you creating? You can wash your hands and eat dog poop. It is disgusting. And that's exactly what the Pharisees are doing because they're so disconnected from the heart of God. And, and friends, culture is just running from this kind of shallow Christianity. I believe the next generation of this culture actually wants to engage with God in a way that totally transforms them. That, that doesn't mean that they're not afraid of it. We're all afraid of it. I mean, it's terrifying coming into the presence of a holy God where you really are aware of all of your inadequacies, all of your sin, all of the issues that we have. And just because we've been saved doesn't mean that everything has been worked out. <laughs> That's why it's a lifetime of processing this in our lives. See, Jesus says the hard work of Christianity or his easy way of Christianity has to do with heart work. It has everything to do with the heart. In verses 14 through 23, he brings up clean and unclean, unclean foods. And he says, he compares this to what comes out of our heart, not what goes inside. This is what he says specifically now, what I love about this is because not that I, I don't think there's any hierarchy of Scripture. I think that all Scripture is God-breathed and is, you know, useful. Um, but sometimes people will say, well, that was Paul. That sin list is Paul. This sin list is from Jesus, okay? So not that I think that there's a difference. These are the sins that he lists. He lists an umbrella term, evil thoughts, to cover sexual immorality. This is any sort of sexual expression outside the covenant of marriage, theft, murder, adultery, all dealt with in the Ten Commandments, very connected to the heart of God, the revelation of God through the Ten Commandments, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy. That's what Jesus says. Envy comes out of the heart. It starts in the heart. Envy is the desire to have what someone else has, right? Social media is really helping us overcome our temptation to envy, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Envy, Jesus says. Jesus lists envy. Then he lists slander. Slander. Speaking untruths about people behind their back or maybe even to their face and helping other people form perception about them based on an untruth. Pride. Jesus lists pride. And last, and I think this is the most hilarious one, is Jesus lists foolishness as a sin that comes from the heart that disconnects us from God. You see, from the moment we're born, we choose to fulfill our own desires. And they lead us down all of these other paths. 
And we might be tempted to think that a bridge that we've created in our own strength can lead us to God. But Jesus says, don't be so foolish. It's impossible. That's why I came. And the good news of Christianity and the good news of following Jesus is that he lived the life that we couldn't live. At every point of temptation, he resisted it so that he could be the perfect model and the perfect sacrifice for us not only to have atonement for our sins, but to have a model to resemble. Jesus never sinned. It's crazy to think that a human that was born just like we have been born has never sinned, that lived a totally pure life. But Jesus did. He was totally pure. My question for us this morning is if we could uncork your soul and allow the world to see, how would that feel? If we could open up your brain and allow the world to see every single thought that you've ever had, in rush hour traffic, <laughs> when no one's looking. <laughs> this is why I said religion that's connected to the heart isn't easy. It's really a higher standard that Jesus presents. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is the message that he lives. And it's not condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because it's Jesus who becomes our righteousness. Do you know that the law is not abolished? The righteous requirements of the law are not abolished, but they are fulfilled in the sinless, perfect lamb of Jesus Christ. So even though your thoughts have not honored God, and, and maybe you, you've gone for some good stretches, right? It's just that one thought is all it takes to permanently disconnect you from the heart of the Father forever. Just one. And most of us have millions and millions and millions of all sorts of stuff coming out of our lives. And at some point, the Holy Spirit convicts us and he kind of brings us alongside of Jesus who begins to patiently work through the issues of the heart so that our heart can reflect him, our Lord and our Savior. It's important that we understand that what comes after this, and I'm going to address this in two weeks, is Jesus isn't just changing the way that we get to God. He's changing who gets to get to God. You know that he's going to go to Tyre and Sidon right after this passage, and he is going to heal a Greek woman's demon-possessed daughter. It's not just that he's changing the way to God. He's opening up the gate for all to experience his pruning. You know, people say that Christianity is so exclusive. No, it's not. It's the most inclusive religion on the face of the planet because Jesus spread his arms this wide and said, anyone can come to me. But the process of working out salvation can be exclusive because he will not allow any sin to enter the presence of God. And the process of experiencing God's transformation can be painful because of all of those things that start here. Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Even after coming to Christ, we experience temptation in these various ways. And my hope for the church is not that we would elevate one sin over all the others, like we so often do in areas of sexuality and all sorts of things, but that we would just be honest with everyone about our brokenness and God's invitation for all people to experience his presence in their lives. Only Jesus can make us pure. That's what the idea of the coal is in that video. Only Jesus can purify our lives. And when we reach out to him, his purity will begin to be our purity. And this is why in the church and in our individual lives, all of our efforts need to be directed towards a growing relationship with Jesus. Everything. 
That's what discipleship is. That is what it means to follow Jesus, that we would walk alongside of Jesus in every aspect of our lives. Not that we would be perfect in every aspect of our lives, but we would be submitted to God, to, to be submitted to Jesus through his ability to bring our heart back into connection with the faith that we are expressing. This is very difficult in a diverse culture. How many of you know diversity can mean all sorts of things to different people, right? So how do we as a church, how do we as individuals grow with Christ in a very diverse world where people have all sorts of different traditions and cultures and ways of doing things? And I want to suggest three things. The first is that we must let Jesus change our hearts first. Oswald Chambers said, it is quite true to say I can't live a holy life but you can decide to let Jesus make you holy. Only Jesus can make us holy, and only Jesus can give us a new heart. Only Jesus can restore us. If you have never made Jesus Lord of your life, I want to invite you right now, even in this moment, to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. That's what keeps you separated from God. And then ask Jesus to fill you with the Holy Spirit, because you cannot do this life without the power of the Holy Spirit. See, oftentimes what happens is we bring an empty cup to God and he pours in his pure water into our lives, doesn't he? And it's that purity of the water that God pours into our lives that is so necessary for life. And when God pours water into our lives, there's still sometimes residue, right, around the bottom and underneath the water. And we've got to allow Jesus to continue to pour the Spirit of God into our lives. It's not a one-time momentary thing. It, it, the invitation for God to continue to be a part of the process of following him, right? This is why Jesus recommends to his disciples when he says, pray like this, Father, for, forgive us so that we can forgive others, right? This is a part of that daily process of prayer and invitation to God to continue to pour his grace into our lives. And when God begins to change our hearts, and that is first, he, uh, he opens us up to a closer and more intimate relationship with Christ. And that's his work. Our work is something called spiritual disciplines. A couple weeks ago, we talked about spiritual disciplines in the titled sermon, How to Grow with Pastor John. And a spiritual discipline is a habit. Uh, it's Bible reading, it's prayer, it's fasting, it's silence and solitude. And these spiritual practices that allow us, they don't make us holy, but they bring us into a place where we can have the Holy Spirit minister to us. On Friday, I went to Vanguard's graduation. Have you ever seen how the academics, they wear the robes in at the beginning, there's an academic processional. How many of you know what that means? That's kind of like, I feel like, how most people understand spiritual disciplines today. They, they're like, oh, I think it's good, but I don't really know how. I think the spiritual disciplines, they make you holy. No, 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 they don't make you holy. <laughs> they warm your heart to the possibility of transformation. Back in the, whenever the robes started to be worn by the professors, it was in the middle of Europe and it was cold. They wore them because they were cold. <laughs> That's why they wore those robes. And we still... Where, but it's like vestigial. It's like no one really knows what, and the only reason why I know that is because I read the thing. I was like, oh, that's why they have robes. I thought, man, you learn something every day. <laughs> and that's what the spiritual disciplines are. They don't make us smart, right? Like the robes don't make a professor smart. They just empower the, the whatever the professor has to do, just like spiritual disciplines give us access to a heart that is transformed as we grow closer to Jesus. And one of the spiritual disciplines that I feel like we've neglected in culture is just the fellowship with other Christians. I mean, church is becoming less and less a part of our weekly rhythm. It really is. And I, I do not want to make people, and I think probably part of the reason is what Jesus is addressing here. It's like people are just tired of all the hypocrisy and all the stuff. Someone came to me and said, Jordan, I'm just ready to quit church. I just, I'm done. I said, well, I've had that thought before because of things that I've experienced. And I encouraged this person to grab a glass of water and fill it to the very top. And I said, walk around the sanctuary. Just walk around the sanctuary, fill it to the very, very top, just walk around the sanctuary. I know that uh, 
sometimes things can not feel right. Maybe you bump into someone and what comes out of someone else's glass doesn't sit right with you. But the reality is, when God pours his spirit into us, if we would focus on the transformation that Jesus is doing in us, an amazing thing happens. I wasn't even looking at any of you. I was just so focused on this because I didn't want it to spill that I wasn't worried about your hypocrisy or your hypocrisy or your hypocrisy or your hypocrisy because all I was worried about was my own hypocrisy. Sometimes we need to allow God to speak to us first. It's not those extra traditions that bring us to Jesus. It's our own allowance of the Spirit to work in us that creates a healthy community for Jesus to work. But our traditions must point to Jesus. And there is a difference between first century Christianity and today. Here's the difference, culture. (laughs) It's the same message, it's the same person, it's the same doctrine, it's the same commandment of God, it's the same heart of God, but it's a different culture. So our forms may not always look the same. That's why I don't wear a robe. Have you ever wondered why I don't walk up here in a tunic? Because that's what Jesus wore. Because our cultures are different. I wear jeans. Jesus didn't even know what jeans were. Was? Is that a word? Here's what I'm trying to say is we've got to recognize that a lot of our traditions are cultural. Now, this is the one that I think hits church people the most because we don't think about this. We very rarely think about culture because we've potentially grown up with it and it's just all of our worldview, right? We've never had a moment where we've disconnected culture from the message. And this, let me just tell you a story. My brother is a pastor of an international church in Thailand. How many of you have been to Thailand? Awesome. Apparently, they don't wear shoes inside. Did you know that? I'm looking at this picture of my brother preaching, and he doesn't have shoes on. Now, you saw the video. What did Moses do when he came into the holy presence of God? He took his shoes off. Anybody see what I have on my feet? So what's the problem with me? I'm wearing shoes and my brother is preaching without shoes. Different cultures. You see, Jesus knows this about cultures. That sometimes principles are expressed in different ways. And sometimes sometimes those traditions help us understand the message better. And in Thailand, it's offensive to wear shoes inside. But it's not here. In fact, it would be offensive for me to take off my shoes. How many of you know what I'm talking about? My wife can explain to you after the service if you're still confused. Isn't God so smart to be able to package a timeless message in the person of Jesus who he had, he was who he was. He was perfect. And yet sometimes we get so tied into our culture, like, Oh, that song's not worshipful because it's too fast. I was on Facebook the other day, and for one moment I was encouraged and discouraged at the same time, let me explain. There's this pastor in Springfield, Missouri, who has just been saved out of a prison. He went to prison for 10 years, got got saved in prison, and when he got out of prison, he went to Bible college, he went to seminary, and God has just called him into ministry. And his church every single week is seeing drug addicts come to Christ. By the way, drug addicts are coming to Christ in this church too. <laughs> Prostitutes are, and, and one of the, the, the sign on, on their church sign says, uh, it says, druggies, addicts, and junkies welcome. Now I know some of you are like, that irritates me and, and I want to help you understand something. That's a problem. He's had all sorts of church people say, that's the most ridiculous sign you can have. Then, so on a Friday night, they just do this thing called Fire, Fire Fridays, and they invite uh, different bands and things, and they brought a metal band. How many of you know what a metal? I know I'm, I'm, I'm like right on the edge of what people are comfortable with right now. It's okay. Jesus is in my heart. 
I can quote the 16 mental, fundamentals of truth to you right now if you need me to. The first line of his status update, status update was, praise God, 12 people gave their lives to Jesus last night. And then he posted a clip of one of the songs. And it was not my style of music, let me tell you that right now. It just wasn't. I don't like to listen to metal music. That's just my preference. Some of you might, and I'm not going to judge you, but 12 people gave their heart to Christ, and yet the only thing all of these different trolls could focus on was the style of this metal music. And if you would have read the lyrics, you would, would have read about Jesus being Lord, about the Holy Spirit working, about all of the things that never change. And we get upset about packaging something with a style that really represents more a cultural uh, expression than the timeless gospel because the timeless gospel is none of your cultural expressions will ever get you to the throne room of Jesus. It is filthy rags. There is nothing about culture that brings us into the presence of Jesus. It's just not good enough. There is no strength, nothing outside of his shed blood, his perfect life brings us into the presence of a holy God. Do we not understand that? It's why I don't go to Nigeria as a missionary and expect them to follow Christianity in the exact, exact cultural express way as they do here. We have stopped thinking missiologically. We have thrown out culture because we think that it's only this way. It's not. That's why there are more Christians today in South America and Central America and Africa than there are in North America. If you are a Caucasian Christian today, you are now amongst the minority. It's just true. Jesus loves people too much to have to force our baggage on other people. He's bringing Jesus to them right where they are. Now, I'm not talking about sin. I'm actually talking about the kind of Christianity that allows our hearts to be laid bare before God. And all of the sin that is in our hearts is given to God and forgiven. This is, the, this is just the unbelievable message of grace that Jesus offers. And if we try to take any sort of legalistic message to a culture that wants a much deeper way of following Jesus, they are just gonna be so done with it. They don't want hypocrisy, they want real. They want authentic. And if we can't be honest with ourselves, if we can't ask what is my culture, what is God's culture, and where's the difference, where is there an intersection, what do I need to hold on to, what do I need to throw away? And here's the easiest way to not assume something about someone, like that person could have done with me. Hey, can we go out to coffee? Because I want to hear your story. I want to hear your culture. I want to know about the way that you follow Jesus. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to learn for myself and get something so that I don't judge you for sinning in a way that I don't struggle with and we can find common ground in Christ. Now, I'm not saying that there won't be conversations. Eventually, as relationship is built, where you really explore, I'm really struggling with, I, I, I just, every time I go to 7-Eleven, I want to steal something. I don't know. <laughs> Right? But sin is never dealt with like that. It's dealt with by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit bringing conviction into our lives and just giving ourselves in total surrender to God. The truth is Jesus knows what's in our hearts and it's not this. And that's why he came. Because our lives are full of all sorts of justifications and rules and even areas in, in us where we know we've sinned and screwed up. But see, just like we want to drink pure water, God does not love polluted water. And he wants to bring pure water to this world and he's chosen imperfect vessels but he's going to pour into you pure water to bring true fulfillment and true sustenance in the life of Jesus. What does that mean? That means real Christianity 
not heartless Christianity. That means the kind of Christianity that our hearts are actually engaged. We don't talk about prayer, we pray, right? (laughs) We acknowledge that and we own it. (laughs) We prioritize our God. We don't just put him on the back burner and just when it comes to me or when it's convenient. They're not interested in that. They want the pure water of God. And if it's not real in our lives, then we need to ask some questions of the way that we practice our faith. But we can't assume anything about anyone until we are able to figure out where culture meets God in their life so that we can come alongside relationally and present hope. Because the reality is God is unconditional about his offer. It doesn't matter if someone has been struggling with a meth addiction for seven years or someone has just divorced their spouse or are going through a divorce or right smack dab in the middle of the hardest, most difficult time of their life. What does Jesus want to do? He wants to forgive. He wants to bring them close to him. That doesn't mean that it's not messy. It's going to be messy. That's just ministry. But if Jesus wasn't deterred by mess, and because of that, we are able to come into his presence and be close to God through Christ, then we can't be deterred by people's mess either. And so I'm so grateful to be a part of a church, to be a part of a faith where God prioritizes what's in our hearts, even though that is the scariest actual reality. But not unless you know Christ. Because every sin that you've ever committed, he died for once and for all. And he can show us the way to living out this faith in a way that honors God's holiness. God says, be holy like I am holy. And there's no way that we can become God, but we can become like Christ. I invite you to stand up this morning, and we're going to just take a moment to allow God to examine our own hearts where we have failed to represent God. And we're going to ask that his holiness and his purity would become our purity.